Welcome to Revision for GCSE History. Today we're going to be looking at the origins of the Cold War, the post-war conflict between the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And one thing that's very important to understand from the outset is that the Cold War, the very seeds of the Cold War, lay in the, in the, in the Second World War and in the fissures that developed between those powers that fought and won the battle against Germany and the Axis powers. Now, the Second World War was won by an unlikely but grand alliance between the USA, the world's largest capitalist economy, the Soviet Union, the world's first communist state, and Great Britain, the world's last remaining significant colonial power. Now, despite the profound differences between these three countries, they fought and, and defeated the Axis powers based on a, a, a very effective cooperation between them in the face of a great and significant enemy, Nazi Germany. But towards the end of the war, as victory came in sight, it became increasingly clear that these three powers had differences of philosophy, differences of influence, and differences of strategy that were simply too great to survive the peace. We'll begin by looking at the three peace conferences that took place towards the end of the Second World War. Those conferences took place in Tehran, in Iran, in 1943, at Yalta in the Crimea, Crimea in February of 1945, and at Potsdam, just outside Berlin, in Germany, in July of 1945. Now, each of these three conferences had very different discussions and was characterized by very different relations between the three members of the Grand Alliance. At Tehran, in 1943, the majority of the discussion between the three leaders of the powers, Joseph Stalin, leader of the Soviet Union, Franklin Roosevelt, President of the United States, and Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, most of their discussion was focused on how to fight the war against Germany, how to bring the war into its closing stages. In particular, the discussion was focused on how the Western powers, Britain and the United States, could better support the Soviet Union in its fight against Germany in the East through the opening of a second front, a Western front, that would, pin, would create a pincer movement between which Germany would ultimately be crushed. But also at Tehran, they discussed the, the fate of Germany after the war. What should that look like? And at that point, there was a high degree of agreement on the part of the three, the three members of the Grand Alliance as to how Germany should be supervised after the end of, of hostilities. There was also some initial discussion about spheres of influence. And this is an important theme that will echo throughout the three peace conferences. It was generally agreed that the Soviet Union would acquire a sphere of influence, a part of Eastern Europe where its views would hold sway. It was also genuinely agreed that the United States or, and Great Britain, the Western powers also including France, would retain their spheres of influence in Western Europe. And there was some discussion of the future of an independent Poland, which obviously sitting immediately between Germany and the Soviet Union was a strategically vital country. Now, by the time the three leaders met in Yalta in February of 1945, the situation was quite different. It was quite clear by this point that Germany was on its last legs, that Germany would soon be defeated. By this point, a grand bargain was struck between the USA on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other. And that bargain really relied upon two elements. The Soviet Union agreed to launch a, a war against Japan in the east, in order to support the USA's campaign against Japan in the Pacific. In return, the United States agreed to ratify its belief in a sphere of influence for the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, a sphere of influence that would effectively create a series of buffer states between the Soviet Union and Germany. The three powers also agreed that Germany, after the war, would be split into four zones, controlled by the members of the three, uh, the, the three members of the Grand Alliance, and also a zone to be controlled by France. They further agreed that Germany should be denazified, 
that all not members of the Nazi party should be driven from positions of influence within Germany and Nazi war criminals should face crime, uh, criminal prosecution. They, they finally agreed that reparations should be paid, fines if you will, for the damage that had been done by the Germany and Axis forces, particularly towards the Soviet Union, which had suffered disproportionately in the course of the battle against Nazism. Now, several months later, in July of 1945, the three leaders met again, this time in Potsdam, outside Berlin, and this time after Germany's surrender. At this point, strains really began to appear in the relations between the three powers. In the first instance, only one of the original members of the Grand Alliance, Marshal Stalin, attended the conference in Potsdam. Franklin Roosevelt had died several months earlier and been replaced by his vice president, Harry Truman. Now, Truman had not been a significant figure in foreign policy or in the way in which the war was fought prior to his ascension to the presidency. He had a great deal to prove at Potsdam as his first real show, of, his first real assertion on the international stage. Secondly, Winston Churchill was voted out of office by the British public at the very beginning of the Potsdam Conference and replaced by Clement Attlee, the leader of the Labour Party. Attlee, likewise, had relatively little experience of foreign affairs and was a new face. And neither Truman nor Attlee had the relationship with Stalin, the experience of dealing with Stalin that their predecessors had nor did they have any particular relationship with one another. So immediately the chemistry between the three leaders had changed, and this was to have an impact on the, the, the extent of agreement that they were able to achieve whilst at Potsdam. Secondly, and crucially, the USA, by July of 1945, had successfully tested its first atomic bomb. This made the USA the first nuclear power in history, and that dramatically strengthened Truman's hand in his negotiations with the other two members of the Grand Alliance. Unbeknownst to, to Truman, Stalin had spies working in the United States who had already informed him of the nature of the atomic weapon. Nonetheless, Truman felt that he had the right to assert the USA's influence and authority over the other two powers. And in particular, he pushed back quite hard on the idea of the Soviet sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. This is critically important in Stalin's mind as a guard against future aggressive action from Germany. Truman was very lukewarm on this idea. Secondly, Truman had a very different view of the future of Germany than Stalin. Stalin, having seen 27 million Russians die in the Second World War, was obviously extremely keen that Germany should suffer and should be kept weak for the longest possible time after the war, economically hobbled by high rates of reparations, and a large amount of its capital stock, its factories, its industry, relocated to the Soviet Union. Truman disagreed. He did not want the powers of, uh, the, of the Grand Alliance to repeat the mistakes that were made at the Versailles Conference after the First World War. He saw a vibrant, thriving Germany reintegrated into the world diplomatic community as the safest possible guarantor against future war. And finally, there was a disagreement over the nature of government that should exist in Poland. Remember, the strategically important nation between the USSR and, and Germany. Truman was not at all keen that Poland should become a communist state and fought back heavily against the idea that, their, that the Poles should not be able to, get to elect their own government. <laughs>